to the Ransom Center. My name is Eric Caleri. I'm the curator for theater and performing arts here. Just out of curiosity, a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to a program at the Ransom Center before? Excellent. Excellent. A lot of you. Welcome back. Uh, so tonight we are pleased to welcome the Hidden Room Theater Company to the Ransom Center stage. Under the artistic direction of Beth Burns, the Austin-based Hidden Room specializes in producing unpublished or rarely seen works. Recently, their production of Nathan Tate's King, King, uh, History of King Lear was performed to critical acclaim here in Austin, Texas, and at the Blackfriars Conference at the American Shakespeare Center in Virginia. In July, they will return to London with their production of Brutamort, the puppet Hamlet from 1710, which will be performed at the Globe Theater. Tonight, they're bringing to life John Wilkes Booth's prompt book for Richard III from the collections of the Ransom Center. You are the first audiences to see this production since uh, 1864. <laughs> so, congratulations on that. <laughs> and Hidden Room is planned to mount a full-scale production at a later date. What you're getting tonight is a sneak preview of what that will look like. As a stage reading, the actors will keep the scripts in their hands throughout the performance, and will recreate movements and gestures described in the prompt book, and in the hundreds of critical reviews that exist of John Wilkes Booth's performances. So think of it as a 21st century actors performing 19th century actors, performing a rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this evening's program is also being webcast live to an international audience, welcome to you, and it will be archived on our website. There will be a brief 10 minute intermission between acts uh, three and four, and we invite you to stick around for a post-show discussion after the performance. This uh, evening's program also kicks off a calendar of related <coughs> Shakespeare events that will go throughout the spring. This is in connection to our uh, exhibition of Shakespeare in print and performance that's running through May 29th, and we'll hope you, you'll come back and see some of the other programs that we'll be doing. Calendars for those are out in the lobby and also on our website. So with that, thank you again, and uh, welcome <coughs> to Hidden Room Theater. King Henry walked forth this morning. No, sir, but it was within his hour. At any time when you see him here, let no stranger into the garden. I would not have him stared at. See who's that now entering at the gate. Sir, the Lord Stanley. Mm. Leave me. My noble lord, you're welcome to the tower. I heard last night you late arrived with news of Edward's victory to his joyful queen. Yes, sir, and I am proud to be the man that first brought home the last of civil broils. The houses of York and Lancaster, like bloody brothers fighting for a birthright, no more shall wound the parent that would part them. Edward now sits secure on England's throne. Near Tewksbury, my lord, I think they fought. Has the enemy lost any men of note? Sir, I was posted home ere an account was taken of the slain, but as I left the field, a proclamation from the king was made in search of Edward, son to your prisoner, King Henry VI, which gave reward to those discovering him and him his life if he'd surrender. <sighs> that brave young prince, I fear, is unlike his father, too high of heart to brook submissive life. This will be heavy news to Henry's ear, for on this battle's cast his all was set. King Henry and ill fortune are familiar. He ever threw with an indifferent hand, but never was known to lose his patience. How does he pass the time in his confinement? As one who wishes, as one whose wishes never reached a crown. The king seems dead in him, but as a man he sighs sometimes in want of liberty. Sometimes he reads and walks and wishes that faith has blessed him with an humbler birth, not to have felt the falling from a throne. Were it not possible to see the king? <laughs> they say he'll talk freely with Edward's friends and even treats them with respect and honor. This is his usual time of walking forth, for he's allowed the freedom of the garden. After his morning prayer, he seldom fails. Behind this arbor, we, we may... We may be unseen a, w a while to observe him. By this time now, the decisive blow is struck. Either my queen and son are blessed with victory, or I'm the cause no more of civil broils. 
Would I were dead, if heaven's good will were so. For what is in this world but grief and care? What noise and bustle do kings make to find it? When life's but a short chance, our gain content, which most pursued is most compelled to fly, and he that mounts him on the swiftest hope shall often run his courser to a stand, while the poor peasant from some distant hill, undangered and at ease, views all the sport and sees content, takes shelter in his cottage. He seems extremely moved. Does he know you? No, nor would I have him. We will show ourselves. <coughs> Why, there's another check to proud ambition. That man received his charge from me, and now I am his prisoner. He locks me to my rest. Such an unlooked-for change, who could suppose, that saw him kneel to kiss the hand that raised him? But that I should not knock, now complain of, since, tis, since I to that tis possible may owe his civil treatment of me. Morrow, Lieutenant! Any news arrived? Who's that with you? Uh, a gentleman that came last night express from Tewkesbury. We've had a battle. Comes he to me with letters or advice? Uh, Sir, he's King Edward's officer, your foe. Nay, then he won't flatter me. You're welcome, sir. Uh, Not less because you are King Edward's friend, for I've almost learned myself to be so. Could I but once forget I was a king, I might be truly happy and his subject. Uh, you gained a battle, is not so? Uh, we have, sir. How will reach your ears too soon? Okay, to my loss, it can't too soon. Pray, speak. For fear makes mischief greater than it is. My queen, my son, say, sir, are they living? Since my arrival, sir, another post came in and brought us word your queen and son were prisoners now at Tewkesbury. And heaven's will be done, and I have only sighs and prayers to help them. King Edward, sir, depends upon his sword. Yet praise heartily when the battle's won and soldiers love a bold and active leader. <laughs> Fortune, like women, will be closely pursued. The English are high mettled, sir, and tis no easy part to fit them. Well, King Edward feels their temper, and twill be hard to throw him. Alas, I thought them men, and rather hoped to win their hearts by mildness than severity. My soul was never formed for cruelty. In my eyes, justice has seemed bloody. When on the city gates I have beheld a traitor's quarters, parching in the sun, my blood has turned with horror at the sight. I took him down and buried with his limbs the memory of the dead man's deeds. Perhaps that pity made me look less terrible, giving the mind of weak rebellion spirit. For kings are put in trust of all mankind, and when themselves take injuries, who is safe? If so, I have deserved these frowns of fortune. Sir, here's a gentleman brings a warrant for his access to King Henry's presence. I come to him. His business may require your privacy. I'll leave you, sir, wishing you all the good that can be wished, not wronging him I serve. Farewell. <laughs> Who can this be? A sudden coldness. Like the damp hand of death has seized my limbs. I fear some heavy news. Oh, uh, what is it, good lieutenant? A gentleman, sir, from Tewkesbury. He seems a melancholy messenger. For when I asked what news his answer was a deep fetched sigh, I would not urge him, but I fear tis fatal. Fatal indeed. His brow's the title page that speaks the nature of a tragic volume. Say, friend, how does my queen, my son? Thou tremblest, and the whiteness of thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even such a man, so faint, so spiritless, drew Priam's curtain in the death of night, and would have told him half his Troy was burned, but Priam found the fire, but Priam found, found the fire ere his tongue, and thou, my poor son's death, ere thou relatest it. Now would thou say, your son did this, and thus, and thus your queen, so fought the valiant Oxford, stopping my greedy ear with her bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away his praise, ending with queen and son, and all are dead. Your queen yet lives, and many of your friends, but for my lord, your why, son. Why he is dead. Yet speak, I charge thee. Tell thou, uh, tell thou thy master his suspicion lies, and I will take it as a kind disgrace, and thank thee well for doing me such wrong. 
what it were wrong to say, but, sir, your fears are true. Yet, oh, for all this, say not my son is dead. Sir, I am sorry that I must force you to believe what would to heaven I had not seen. But in this last battle near Tewkesbury, your son, whose active spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in our camp, still made his way where dangers stood to oppose him. A braver youth of more courageous heat ne'er spurred his courser at the trumpet's sound, but who can rule the uncertain chance of war? In fine, King Edward won the bloody field, where both your queen and son were made his prisoners. Yet hold, for oh, this prologue lets me in for a most fatal tragedy to come. Died he a prisoner, sayst thou, how by grief? Or by the bloody hands of those that caught him? After the fight, Edward in triumph asked to see the captive prince. And the prince was brought, whom Edward roughly chid for bearing arms, asking what reparation he could make for having stirred his subjects to rebellion. Your son, impatient of such taunts, replied, Bow like a subject, proud, ambitious York, while I now speaking with my father's mouth, propose the selfsame rebel words to thee, which, traitor, thou wouldst have, have me answer to. From these more words arose, till in the end King Edward swelled with that unhappy prince at such a time too freely spoke. His gauntlet in his young face with indignation struck, at which crooked Richard, Clarence, and the rest buried their fatal daggers in his heart. In bloody state I saw him on the earth from whence with life he never more sprung up. Oh, hadst thou stabbed at every word's deliverance, sharp poignards in my flesh while this was told. Thy wounds have given me less anguish than thy words. Oh, and methinks I see thy tender lamb grasping beneath the ravenous wolves fell gripe. But say, did all, did all strike him, sayst thou? All, sir, but the first wound Duke Richard gave. There, let him stop, be that the last of ills. Oh, barbarous act, inhospitable men against the rigid laws of arms to kill him. Was not enough his hope of birthright gone? Must your hate be leveled at his life? Could not his father's wrongs content you? Could not a father's grief dissuade the deed? You have no children, butchers, if you had. The thought of them would sure have stirred remorse. Take comfort, sir, and I hope a better day. Oh, 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 who can hold the fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty caucuses? Or wallow naked in December's snow by bare remembrance of the summer's heat? Away, my head, I shall pour his sight whoever bids me be of comfort more. If thou wilt soothe my sorrows, then I'll thank thee. Oh, now thou art kind indeed, these tears oblige me. Alas, my lord, I, I fear more evil towards you. Why, well, let it come. I, I scarce shall feel it now. My present woes have beat me to the ground, and my hard fate can make me fall no lower. What can it be? Give it the ugliest shape. A word does that. It comes in Gloucester's form. Rightful indeed. Give me the worst that threatens. After the murder of your son, stern Richard, as if unsated with the wounds he had given with unwashed hands, went from his friends in haste, and being asked by Clarence of the cause, he lowering cried, Brother, I must to the tower. I've business there. Excuse me to the king. Before you reach the town, expect some news. This said he vanished. And I here's arrived. Why, then the period of my woes is set, for ills but thought by him are half performed. Forgive me, sir, what I'm compelled to obey. An order for your close confinement. Whence comes it, good lieutenant? Sir, from the Duke of Gloucester. Good night to all, then. I obey it. And now, good friend, suppose me on my deathbed. And take of me thy last short-living leave. Nay, nay, keep thy tears till thou hast seen me dead. <laughs> and when in tedious winter's nights, with good old folks thou stir sit up, sit'st up late to hear them tell the dismal tales of times long past, e'en now, with woe remembered, before thou bidst good, uh, bidst good night to quit their grief, tell thou the lamentable fall of me. 
and send thy heroes to their send thy heroes weeping to their beds. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the sun of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. <laughs> our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms are changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war has smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounted barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not made for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to trot before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of a man's fair proportion, cheated of feature of dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time unto this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable, that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. By I. And this weak, piping time of peace have no delight to pass away my hours, <laughs> lest to see my shadow in the sun, and the descant and descant on my own deformity. Since then is this, uh, since this earth affords no joy to me but to command, to check and o'erbear such as are of happier person than myself, why then to me? This restless world's but hell, till this misshapen trunk aspiring head be circled by a glorious diadem. <laughs> but then tis fixed on such a height, oh, I must stretch the utmost reaching of my soul. <laughs> I'll climb the times without remorse or dread, and my first step shall be on Henry's head. Asleep so soon, but sorrow minds no seasons. The morning, noon, the night with her is the same. She's fond of any hour that yields repose. Who's there? Oh, uh, oh Lieutenant. Is it you? <clears throat> you shake, my lord, and look affrighted. Oh. I have had the fearless dream. Such nights that, as I live, I would not pass another hour so dreadful, though twere to buy a world of happy days. Uh, reach me a book. I'll try reading if I can to divert these melancholy thoughts. Good day, my lord. <laughs> what, at your book so hard? I disturbed you. You do indeed. Mm. <laughs> Friend, leave us to ourselves. We must confer. <clears throat> what bloody scene has Rochus now to act? <laughs> Suspicion haunts the guilty mind. <laughs> the thief does fear each bush an officer. Where thieves without controlment rob and kill, the traveler does fear each bush a thief. The poor bird that has already lined with trembling wings misdoubts at every bush. And I, the hapless mate of one sweet bird, have now the fatal object in my eye by whom my young one bled, was caught and killed. Why, what a peevish fool was that of Crete that taught his son the office of a fowl. <laughs> and yet for all his wings the fool was drowned. Thou shouldst have taught the boy his prayers alone, and then he had not broke his neck with climbing. Ah, oh, kill me with thy weapon, not thy words. My breast can better brook thy dagger's point than can my ears that piercing story. Thanks, thou. Wherefore dost thou comest for my life? 
thinks now I am an executioner. Yeah, murdering the executing, and that the worst of executioners. Thy son I killed for his presumption. Hadst thou been killed, when thou first did presume, thou hadst not lived to kill a son of mine! But thou wert born to massacre mankind. How many old men sighs and widows moans? How many orphans, water standing eyes, men's for their sons, wives for their husbands' fate, and children for their parents' timeless death, will rule the hour that ever thou wast born! The owl shrieked at thy birth an evil sign. The night crow cried, foreboding luckless times. Dogs howled, and hideous tempests shook down trees. The raven rooked her on the chimney top, and chattering pies in dismal discord sung. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. Teeth hadst thou in thy head when thou wast born, to its, which plainly said thou camest to bite mankind. And if the rest be true, which I have heard, <sighs> thou camest... I'll hear no more! Die, prophet, in thy speech, for this among the rest was I ordained. <sighs> oh. Much more slaughter after this. Just hen, forgive my sins and pardon me. What? Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death. <laughs> oh, may such purple tears always be shed for those that wish the downfall of our house. If any spark of life yet be remaining, down, down to hell and say I sent thee hither. <laughs> that I have neither pity, love, nor fear, Indeed, tis true what Henry told of me, for I have often heard my mother say I came into the world with legs forward. The midnife, midwife wondered, and the women cried, God, heaven bless us, he is born with teeth. <laughs> and so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. <laughs> and since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. I have no brother, and I am like no brother. Let this word love, which graybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another and not in me. I am myself alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keep'st me from the light. But if I fail not, in my deep intent, thou hast not another day to live, which done, heaven take the weak king Edward to his mercy, and leave the world for me to bustle in. Soft, I'm sharing the spoil before the field is won. Clarence still breathes, Edward still lives and reigns. When they are gone, then I must count my gains. <laughs> It was her excuse to avoid me. Alas, she keeps no bed. She has health enough to progress as far as Chertsey, though not to bear the sight of me. I cannot blame her, why love forswore me in my mother's womb. And for I should not deal in his soft laws, he did corrupt frail nature with a bribe to shrink my arm up like a withered shrub, to make an envious mountain on my back where sits deformity to mock my body. To shape my legs of an equal size, to disproportion me in every part. And I am then a man to be beloved. <laughs> O oh, monstrous thought, more vain than my ambition. My lord, I beg your grace. Mm. Be gone, fellow, I am not at leisure. My lord, your brother, the king, is taken ill. I'll wait on him, leave me, friend. Ah, 
Edward taken ill, <laughs> would he were wasted, marrow, bones, and all, that from his loins no more young brats may rise to cross me in this golden time I look for. See, my love appears. Look where she shines, darting pale luster like the silver moon. Though her doth through her dark veil of rainy sorrow. So mourn the dame Ephesus her love, and thus the soldier armed with resolution, told his soft tale and was a thriving wooer. Tis true, my form may perhaps a little move her, but I've a tongue shall wheedle with the devil. Why I can smile and murder while I smile, <laughs> and cry content at that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. Yet hold, she mourns the man that I have killed. First, let her sorrow take some vent. Stand here. I'll take her passion with its wane, and turn this storm of grief to gentle drops of pity for her repentant murderer. Hung be the heavens in black, yield day to night. Comets importing change of times and states, brandish your fiery trestles across the sky, and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented to King Henry's death. Oh, be accursed the hand that shed this blood, accursed the head that had the heart to do it, if ever he have wife. Let her be made more miserable by the life of him than I am now by Edward's death and thine. Poor girl, what pain she takes to curse herself. If ever he have child, abortive be it, prodigious and untimely brought to light, whose hideous form, whose most unnatural aspect, may fright the hopeful mother at her view, and that be heir to his unhappiness. Now on to Jersey with your sacred load. Stay! You that bear the course and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted charitable deeds? Villain, set down the course, or by St. Paul, I'll make a course of him that disobeys. My lord, stand back and let the casket pass. Unmannered slave, stand now when I command. Advance thy home, but higher than thy breast, or by St. Paul, I'll strike thee to my foot and spurn upon thee, beggar, for thy boldness. Why dost thou haunt him thus, unsated fiend? Thou hast but power over his mortal body. Thou, his soul thou canst not reach, therefore be gone. Sweet saint, be not so hard for charity. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. Why didst thou do this deed? Could not the laws of man, or nature, nor heaven, of man, nature, nor heaven, dissuade thee? No beast so fierce, but know some pity. If want of pity be a crime so hateful, whence is it thou, fair excellence, art guilty? What means the slanderer? Vouchsafe divine perfection of a woman, of these my crimes supposed, to give me leave by circumstance but to acquit myself. Then take that sword, whose bloody point still reeks with Henry's life, with my loved lords, young Edwards, and let out here thy own, to appease their ghosts. By such despair I should accuse myself. By my despairing only canst thou stand excused. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant ye. Oh, he was gentle, loving, mild, and virtuous. But he is in heaven, where thou canst never come. Was I not kind to send him thither then? He was much fitter for that place than earth. And thou, unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon! Your bedchamber. I'll rest beside the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie in yours. Oh, I hope so. I know so. But gentle lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our tongues and fall to something of more serious method. Is not the causer of the untimely deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner? No, works the cause and most accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty that did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world so I might live one hour in that soft, 
Bosom. By thought that I tell thee, homicide, these hands should rend that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could not endure that beauty's wreck. You should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is nourished by the sun, so I, by that, it is my day, my life. I would it were to be revenged on thee. It is a quarrel most unnatural to wish revenge on him that loves thee. Say then, it is my duty to seek revenge on him that killed my husband. Fair creature, he that killed thy husband did it to help thee to a better husband. This better does not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The selfsame name, but one of softer nature. Where is he? I take more pity in thy eyes and see him here. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. I would they were that I might die at once. For now they kill me with a living death, darting with cruel aim, despair, and love. I never sued to friend or enemy. My tongue could never learn soft wooing words. But now thy beauty is proposed by me. My proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Is there a tongue on earth that can speak for thee? Why dost thou court my hate? Oh, teach not thy soft lip such cold contempt. Of thy relentless heart cannot forgive. Lo, here I lend thee this sharp pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true breast and let the honest soul out that adores thee and lay it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg that death upon my knee. What shall I say or do? Direct me, heaven. But twas thy wondrous beauty did provoke me. Oh, now dispatch. Twas that I that stabbed young Edward. <laughs> but twas thy heavenly face that set me on. And I might still persist, so stubborn is my temper, to rejoice at what I've done. But that thy powerful eyes, as roaring seas, away the changes of the moon, have turned my heart and made it flow with penitence. Take up the sword again, or take up me. No! Although I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. <laughs> that was in thy rage. Say it again. Even with thy word, this guilty hand that robbed thee of thy love shall for thy love revenge thee on thy lover. To both their deaths shalt thou be a curse accessory. Thou not forgive me to forgive thy crimes. They are not to be forgiven. No, not even penitence can atone them. Oh, misery of thought that strikes me with a once repentance and despair. Thou unpardoned, yield me pity. Would I knew thy heart! Tis figured in my tongue. I fear me both are false. Then never was man true. Put up thy sword. Say then, my peace is made. That shalt thou know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. I swear, bright saint, I am not what I was. Those eyes have turned my stubborn heart to woman. Thy goodness makes me soft and penitent, and my harsh thoughts are turned to peace and love. Oh, if thy poor devoted, ser devoted servant might but beg one favor at thy gracious hand, thou wouldst confirm his happiness forever. What is That it may please thee, leave these sad designs to him that has most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby House, where, after I have solemnly interred at Chersey Monastery this injured king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duties see you. For divers unknown reasons, I beseech you, grant me this favor. I do, my lord, and much it joys me, too, to see you are become so penitent. <laughs> Tressel and Stanley, go along with me. Bid me farewell. It is more than you deserve. 
But since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. Towards Chertsey, my lord? No, to Whitefriars. They attend my coming. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? <laughs> Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. <laughs> what? I killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremest hate? To curse the, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes with bleeding witness of my hatred by? Having heaven, her conscience, in these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit with all but the plain devil and dissembling looks. <laughs> and yet to win her, all the world is nothing. <laughs> Can she abase her beauteous eyes on me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety? My dukedom. To a beggarly dinier, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous proper man. <laughs> I'll have my chambers lined with looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors. <laughs> To study fashions to adorn my body, since I am crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. But first, I'll turn St. Harry to his grave, and then return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair sun, till I salute my glass, that I might see my shadow as I pass. Did you see the Duke? What Duke, my lord? His Grace of Gloucester, did you see him? Not lately, my lord, I hope no ill news. The worst that heart e'er bore or tongue can utter. Edward the King, his royal brother's dead. Oh, tis sad indeed. I wish by your impatience to acquaint him, though you make it so to him. Did the King, my lord, make any mention of a protector for his crown and his... <laughs> Children. He did. Duke Richard has care of both. Well, that sad news you're afraid to tell him, too. He'll spare no toils, I'm sure, to fill his place. For heaven, he's not too diligent. My lord, is not that the Duchess of York, his, the king's mother, I, coming, I fear, to visit him? Tis she, little thinking what has befallen us. Good day, my lords. How takes the king his rest? Alas, madam, too well. He sleeps forever. Dead. Oh, good heaven, support me. <coughs> Madam, t'was my unhappy lot to hear his last despairing groans <gasps> and close his eyes. Another taken from me, too. Why, just heaven, am I still left the last in life and woe? First I bemoaned a noble husband's death, and yet lived with looking on his images. But now my last support is gone. First Clarence, now Edward is forever taken from me. And I must now afford sink down with sorrow. Your youngest son, the noble Richard, lives. His love, I know, will feel his mother's cares and bring new comfort to your latter days. Twere new indeed, for yet of him I've none, unless a churlish disposition may be counted from a child as a mother's comfort. Where's the queen, my lord? I left her with your kinsmen, deep in sorrow, who have with much ado persuaded her to leave the body. Uh, madam, she is here. Why do you thus oppose my grief, unless to make me rave and weep the faster, huh? My mother, too, in tears. Fresh sorrow strikes my heart at sight of every friend that loved my Edward <laughs> living. Oh, mother, he is dead. Edward, my lord, thy son is dead. How oh, that my eyes could weep away my soul that I might follow 
worthy of his hearse. Your duty, madam, of a wife is dead, and now the mother's only claims your care. Think on the prince, your son. Send for him straight. Let his coronation clear your eyes. Bury your griefs in the dead of Edward's grave. Revive your joys in living Edward's throne. Alas, that thought but adds to my affliction. New tears for Edward gone and fears for Edward living. An helpless child in his minority is in the trust of his stern uncle Gloucester, a man that frowns on me and all of mine. Judge not so hardly, madam, of his love. Your son will find in him a father's care. Ah, why, ah, these tears look well. Sorrow's the mode, and everyone at court must wear it now. <laughs> With all my heart, I'll not be out of fashion. My lord, just heaven knows I never hated Gloucester, but would on any terms embrace his friendship. These words would make him weep. I know him yours. See where he comes in sorrow for our loss. My lord, good morrow. Cousin of Buckingham, I am yours. Good morning to your grace. <laughs> Methinks we met like men that had forgot to speak. We may remember, but our argument is now too mournful to talk. It is indeed. Peace be with him that made it so. Sister, take comfort. Tis true, we all have cause to mourn the dimming of our shining star. But sorrow never could revive the dead. And if it could, hope will prevent our tears. So we must weep because we weep in vain. Madam, my mother, I do cry mercy. My grief was blind. I did not see your grace. Most humbly on my knees, I crave your blessing. Thou hast it, and my, may thy charitable heart and tongue love one another. Endow thy breast with meekness and obedience. Amen. Oh. <laughs> and make me die a good old man. That's the old butt end of a mother's blessing. I marvel that her grace did leave it out. My lords, I think to a fit that now Prince Edward, forthwith from Ludlow, should be sent for home in order for his coronation. By all means, my lords, come, let's to council and appoint who shall be the messengers. Madam and you, my sister, please you go to give your sentiments on this occasion. My lord, your wisdom needs no help from me. My glad consent you have in all that's just, or for the people's good, though I suffer by it. Please you, retire, madam. We shall propose what you'll not think the people's wrong, nor yours. May heaven prosper all your good intent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Amen with all my heart, for mine's the crown, and is not that a good one? <laughs> ah, she prayed not well, cousin. I hope she prophesied. Mm. You now stand fair. Now, by St. Paul, I feel it here. Me, ma methinks the massy weight on galls my laden brow. What think thou, cousin? Were not an easy matter to get Lord Standy's hand to help it out? My lord, I doubt that. For his father's sake, he loves the prince too well. He'll scarce be one to anything uh, against him. Poverty, the reward of honest fools. <laughs> or take him for it. What thinkst thou then of Hastings? He shall be tried, my lord. I'll find out Catesby, who shall, at subtle distance, sound his thoughts. But we must still suppose the worst may happen. What if we find him cold to our design? Chop off his head. <laughs> Something we will soon determine. But haste, find out Catesby. That done, follow me to the council chamber. What will not be seen together much? nor have it known that we confer in private. Therefore, away, good cousin. I am gone, my lord. Mm. 
Thus far we run before the wind. My fortune smiles and gives me all that I dare ask. The conquered lady Anne is bowed and vows, fast as the priest can make us, we are one. The king, my brother, sleeps without his pillow, and I am left guardian of his infant heir. Let me see. The prince will soon be here. Let him. A crown. Oh, yes, he shall have twenty globes and scepters, too. New ones made to play with all, but no coronation. Nor any court plies about him. No kinsman. Hold ye. Where shall we keep him in his court? The tower? Aye. The tower. <laughs> And welcome to London! <laughs> welcome to all those honored dignities which by your father's will and by your birth you stand the undoubted heir possessed of. And if I may, my plain simplicity of heart may take the liberty to show itself, your father welcome to your uncle's care and love. Why do you sigh, my lord? The weary way has made you melancholy? No, uncle, but our crosses on the way have made it tedious, wearisome, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. Oh. <laughs> ah. My lord, the mayor of London comes to greet you. Vouchsafe, most gracious sovereign, to accept the general homage of our loyal city. We father beg your royal leave to speak in deep condolement of your father's loss. Mm. And as for our true sorrow, we'll permit to congratulate your accession to the throne. I thank you, good my lord, and thank you all. Alas, my youth is yet unfit to govern. <laughs> Therefore, the sword of justice is in abler hands. <laughs> but be assured of this, so much already I perceive I love you, that though I know not yet to do your offices of good, yet this I know, I'll sooner die than basely do you wrong. So why so young, they say, new heir live long? I thought my mother and my brother York would long ere this have met us on the way. Say, Uncle Gloucester, if our brother come, where shall we sojourn till our coronation? Where it shall seem best to your royal self. May I advise you, sir, some day or two your highness shall repose you at the tower. Then. Where you please, and shall be thought most fit for your best health and recreation. Oh, I at the tower, but be it as you please. My lord, your brother's grace of York. Oh, Richard of York. How fair is our dearest brother. My dear lord, so must I call you now. My brother, to our grief as it is yours. Too soon he died, he might have worn, better worn that title, which in me will lose its majesty. How fares our cousin noble lord of York? Thank you, kindly dear uncle. Oh, my lord, you said that idle weeds were fast in growth. The king, my brother, has outgrown me far. He has, my lord. And therefore, is he idle? Oh, pretty cousin, I must not say so. Nay, uncle, I do not believe the same is true. For if it were, you'd be an idle weed. How so, cousin? <laughs> because I have heard folks say you grew so fast your teeth could gnaw a crust at two hours old. <laughs> now twelve two years ere I could get a tooth. <laughs> Indeed, the brat is taught this lesson. <laughs> Who told thee this, my pretty merry cousin? I, your nurse, dear mm, My nurse, child. She was dead for thou wert born. It was not she. I cannot tell who told me. Ah, so subtle, so subtle too. Tis pity thou art short-lived. My brother, uncle, will be cross in talk. Oh, fear not, my lord. We shall never quarrel. <laughs> I hope your grace knows how to bear with him. You mean to bear me? Not to bear with me. Uncle, my brother mocks both you and me because I am little like an ape. He thinks you should bear me on your shoulder. <laughs> my brother has no such meaning. <laughs> 
Mm, my lord, would you please you pass along? Myself and my good cousin of Buckingham will to your mother to entreat her to meet and bid you welcome to the tower. What? Will you to the tower, my dear lord? My lord protector will have it so. Mm. I shan't sleep in quiet at the tower. I'll warrant you. King Henry lay there and he sleeps in quiet. Oh. What should you fear, brother? Our Uncle Clarence's ghost? My lord, my grandmother told me he was killed there. Oh. I feel no, fear no uncle's dead. Nor any, sir, that live, I hope. I hope so, too. But come, lords, to the tower, since it must be so. Thank you, my lord. This little prating York was not instructed by his subtle mother to taunt and scorn you thus opprobriously. No doubt. No doubt. No, oh, tis a shrewd young master. Stubborn, bold, quick, forward, and capable. He's all the mothers from top to toe. But let them rest. Now what says Catesby? My lord, if tis much as I suspected, and... He's here himself to inform you. <laughs> so, Catesby, hast thou been tampering? What's the news? My lord, according to the instruction given me, with words at distance dropped, I sounded Hastings, piercing how far he did affect your purpose, to which, indeed, I found him cold, unwilling. The sum is this. He seemed a while to understand me not. At length, from plainer speaking, urged to answer, he said in heat, Rather than wrong the head to whom the crown was due, he'd lose his own. Indeed. His own, then, answer for that saying, he'll be taken care of. <sighs> Meanwhile, Catesby, be thou near me. Cousin of Buckingham, let's not lose time. The mayor and citizens are now at busy meeting in Guildhall. Thither. I'd have you haste immediately, and at your meet advantage of the time, improve those hints I gave you late to speak of. But above all, infer the bastardry of Edward's children. Doubt not, my lord. I'll play the orator as if myself might wear the golden fee for which I plead. If you thrive well, bring them to see me here, where you shall find me seriously employed with the most learned fathers of the church. I fly, my lord, to serve you. To serve thyself, my cousin. For look, when I am king, claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford and all those movables whereof the king my brother stood possessed. I shall remember that your grace was bountiful. Cousin, I have said it. I'm gone, my lord. So I've secured my cousin here. These movables will never let his brain rest till I am king. <clears throat> Catesby, go with you with speed to Dr. Shaw and thence to Friar Buker. Bid them both attend me here within an hour at farthest. Meanwhile, my private orders shall be given to look out all admittance to the princes. Now, by St. Paul, the work goes bravely on. <laughs> How many frightful stops would conscience make in some soft heads to undertake like me? Come, this conscience is a convenient scarecrow. It guards the fruit which priests and wise men taste, who never set it up to fright themselves. They know tis rags and gather it or the, gather in the face aunt, while half-starved shallow daws through fear are honest. <laughs> Why were these laws made but that were rogues by nature. Conscience, tis our coin. We live by parting with it. The protesting lover buys hope with it. The deluded version, short-lived pleasure. Old graybeards cram their avarice with it. Your late John hungry judge will dine upon it and hang the guiltless rather than eat his mutton cold. The crown head quits it for despotic sway. The stubborn people of unawed rebellion, there's not a slave but has his share of villain. Why then shall after ages think my deeds inhuman, since my worst are but ambition? Even all mankind to some loved ill incline. Greater men choose greater sins. Ambition's mine. When, when shall I have rest? Was marriage made to be the scourge of our offenses here? Oh no, twas meant 
a blessing to the virtuous as once was to me, though now my curse, I see, becomes the rude disturber of my pillow. Ah, still in tears, let them flow on. <laughs> They're signs of substantial grief. Why won't she die? She uh, must. My interest will not let her live. Fair Elizabeth hath caught my eye. Oh, my heart's vacant, and she shall fill her place. They say that women have but tender hearts. Tis a mistake, I doubt. I find them tough. They'll bend indeed, but he must strain that cracks them. All I can hope is to throw her into sickness, that I might send her a physician's help. So, madam, what? You still take care, I see, to let the world believe I love you not. <laughs> this outward mourning now has malice in it. So have these sullen, disobedient tears. I'd have you tell the world I dote upon you. I wish I could, but would not be believed. Oh. Have I deserved this usage? You have. You please me not as at first. What have I done? What crime have I committed? To me, the worst of crimes. Outlived my liking. If that be criminal, just heaven be kind and take me while my penitence is warm. Oh, sir, forgive and kill me. <laughs> the meddling world will call that murder, and I would have them think me pitiful. <laughs> now, wert thou not afraid of self destruction, thou hast a fair excuse for it. How fain would I be friends with death, oh, name it. Thy husband's hate. Nor do I hate thee only for the dulled edge of sated appetite, but from the eager love I bear another. Some call me hypocrite. What thinkst thou now? Do I dissemble? Thy vows of love to me were all dissembled. Mm, not one. But when I told thee so, I loved. Thou art the only soul I never yet deceived. And tis my honesty that tells thee now, with all my heart, I hate thee. <laughs> this have no effect. She is immortal. <laughs> Forgive me, heaven, that I forgave this man. Oh, may my story, told in after ages, give warning to our easy sex's ears. May it unveil the hearts of men and strike them deaf to dissimulated love. Now, Catesby. My lord, his grace of Buckingham attends your highness' pleasure. Wait on him. I'll expect him here. <clears throat> your absence, madam, will be necessary. Would my death were so. Maybe shortly. <laughs> now, cousin, what says my citizens? Now, by our hopes, my lord, they are senseless and stones. Their hesitating fear has struck them dumb. Touched you the bastardry of Edward's children? I did. <coughs> With his contract to the Lady Lucy, nay, his own bastardy and tyranny for trifles, laid open all your victories in Scotland, your discipline in war, wisdom and peace, your bounty, justice, fair humility, indeed, left nothing that might gild our cause, untouched or slightly handled in my talk. And when my oration drew towards an end, I urged them that loved their country's good to do you right and cry, long live King Richard! And did they so? Not one by heaven. <laughs> but each like statues fixed. Speechless and pale stared in his fellow's face, which, when I saw, I reprehended them and asked the mayor what meant this willful silence. And his answer was, the people were not used to be spoken to but by the recorder, who <laughs> then took him on him to repeat the words. <clears throat> Thus said the duke. Thus hath the duke inferred, but nothing urged in warrant from himself. When he had done, some followers of my own at the lower end of the hall hurled up their caps and some ten voices cried, God save King Richard, at which I took advantage of those few and cried, Thanks, gentle citizens and friends. This general applause and cheerful shout argues your wisdom and your love to Richard. And even here broke off and came away. Oh, timeless blocks! Will they not speak? 
Will not the mayor then and his brethren come? The mayor is at hand. <clears throat> Feign you some fear, and be not spoken with, but by mighty suit, a prayer book in your hand. My lord, were well, standing between two churchmen of repute. For on that ground I'll make a holy descant, yet be not easily won at our request. Seem like a virgin, fearful of your wishes. My other self, my counsel's consistory, <laughs> my oracle, my prophet, my dear cousin, I as child will go by thy direction. The Lord Mayor is at hand. Away, my lord. No doubt, but yet we reach the point proposed. We cannot fail, my lord, while you are pilot. A little flattery sometimes goes well. <laughs> Welcome, my lord. I dance attendance here. I'm afraid the duke will not be spoken with all. Uh, now, Catesby, what says your lord to my request? My lord, he does humbly entreat your grace to visit him tomorrow or the next day. He's now retired with two right reverend fathers divinely bent to meditation. And in no worldly suit would he be moved to interrupt his holy exercise. Return, good Catesby, to the gracious Duke. Tell him, myself, the mayor, and citizens, in deep designs, in matter of great moment, no less importing than our general good, are come to have some conference with his grace. My lord, I'll instantly inform his highness. Ah, oh, my lord, this is not an Edward. He is not lulling on a lewd love bed, but on his knees in meditation. Not dallying with a brace of courtesans, but with two deep divines in sacred praying. Happy were England, would that virtuous prince take on himself the toil of sovereignty. Happy indeed, my lord. He will not sure refuse our proffered love. Alas, my lord, you know him not. His mind's above the world. He's for a crown immortal. There, the door opens. Now, where is our hope? See where his grace stands between two clergymen. Aye, tis there he's caught. There's his ambition. How low he bows to thank him for their cure. And see a prayer book in his hand. <laughs> Would he were king, we'd give him leave to pray. Methinks I wish it for the love he bears the city. How have I heard him vow he thought it hard that a mayor should lose his title with his office? Well, who knows, he may be one. Oh, my <laughs> lord. See, he comes forth. My friends, be resolute. I know he's cautious to a fault, but do not leave him till our honest suit is granted. <clears throat> Cousin Buckingham, I do beseech your grace to pardon me, who, earnest in my zealous meditation, so long deferred the service of my friends. Now, do I fear I have done some strange offense that looks disgracious in the city's eye? If so, Tis just you should reprove my ignorance. You have, my lord. We wish your grace on our entreaties would amend your fault. Else wherefore breathe I in a Christian land. No, then it is your fault that you resign the sceptered office of your ancestors. Fair England's throne, your own due right of birth to the corruption of a blemished stock in... Uh, in this just cause, I come to move, your highness, that on your gracious self you'd take the charge and kingly government of this your land, not as protector, steward, substitute, or lowly factor of another's gain, but as successively from blood to blood, your own right of birth, a lineal glory. Upon our knees, my lord, we beg your grace to wear this precious robe of dignity, which on a child must sit too loose and heavy. Tis yours, befitting both your wisdom and your birth. Oh, oh. My lord, this coldness is unkind, nor suits it with such ardent loyalty. Oh, make them happy, grant their lawful suit. Alas, why would you heap this care on me? 
I am unfit for state in majesty. I thank you for your loves, but must declare, I do beseech you, take it not amiss, I will not, dare not, must not yield to you. If you refuse, through a soft remorse, lot that oppose the child, your brother's son, as well we know your tenderness of heart, yet no, Though you deny us to the last, your brother's son shall never reign as king, but we will plant some other on the throne to the disgrace and downfall of your house. And thus resolved, I bid you, sir, farewell. My lord and gentlemen, I beg your pardon for this vain trouble. My intent was good. I would have served my country and my king, but twill not be. Farewell till next we meet. Be not too rash, my lord. His grace relents? Away, but you deceive yourselves. <laughs> Sweet prince, accept their suit. If you deny us, all the land will rue it. Call him again. <laughs> you will enforce me to a world of cares. I am not made of stone, but penetrable to your kind entreaties. Though heaven knows against my own inclining. Ah, oh, cousin of Buckingham and sage grave men, since you will buckle fortune on my back to bear her burthen, whether I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. But if black scandal or foul-faced reproach attend the secret of your imposition, you were enforcement shall acquaint you may, your mere enforce, enforcement shall acquaintance me. For heaven knows, as you may partly see, how far I am from the desire of this. Heaven guard your grace. We see it and will say it. You will but say the truth, my lord. My heart's so full, it scarce can vent for words. My knee will better speak my duty now. Long live our sovereign, Richard, King of England! Indeed, your words have touched me nearly, cousin. Pray. Rise. <laughs> I wish you could recall him. It would be treason now, my lord. Tomorrow, if you please, your majesty from council orders shall be given for your coronation. Mm, even when you please, for I, you will have it so. Tomorrow, then, we'll attend your majesty. And now we take our leave in joy. Cousin Adu, my loving friends, farewell. I must unto my holy work again. By <laughs> now my golden dream is out. Ambition, like an early friend, throws back my curtain with an eager hand, or joy to tell me what I dreamt is true. <laughs> The bright reward of ever daring minds. Oh, how thy glory wraps my soul. Nor can the means that got thee dim thy luster. For not men's love, fear pays thee adoration. And fame not more survives from good than evil deeds. The aspiring youth that fired the Ephesian dome outlives in fame the pious fool that raised it. Shall I still more lives immersed yet be drained? Crowns got with blood must be by blood maintained. <laughs>
do not leave me yet, for I have many more complaints to tell you. <laughs> and I am able to address the least. What wouldst thou say, my child? Oh, mother, since I have lain in the tower, my rest is still broke with frightful dreams. For shocking news wakes me into tears. I'm scarce allowed a friend to visit me. And all my old honest servants are turned off, and in their rooms are ill, strange-natured men who look so bold as they were my masters, and I'm scared that they will shortly take you from me. Oh, mournful hearing. Oh, unhappy prince. Oh, dear brother, why do you weep so? You make me cry too. Oh, alas, poor innocence. Oh, would I but know at what my uncle aims. If it were my crown, I freely give it to him, so he but let me enjoy my life in quiet. Why, will my uncle kill us, brother? Oh, I hope he won't, for we never <laughs> injured him. I cannot bear to see him thus. <clears throat> Madam, I hope your majesty will pardon what I am grieved to tell. Unwelcome news. I'll be more sorrow yet. We've long despaired of happy tidings, pray what is. On Tuesday last, your noble kinsman Rivers, Gray, and Sir Thomas Vaughan at Pomfret were executed on a public scaffold. Oh, dismal tidings. Oh, poor uncles, I doubt my turn is next. For mine, I fear, far off. Why then? Let's welcome blood and massacre, yield all our throats to the fell tiger's rage, and die lamenting one another's wrong. Oh, I foresaw the ruin of our house. Madam, the king has sent me to inform your majesty that you prepare, as is advised from council, tomorrow for your royal coronation. What do I hear? Support me, heaven. Despiteful tidings, on pleasing news. Alas, I heard before, but could not for my soul find heart to tell you of it. The king does farther wish your majesty would less employ your visits at the tower. He gives me leave to attend you to the court, and is impatient, madam, till he sees you. Farewell to all, and thou, poor, injured queen, forgive the unfriendly duty I must pay. Alas, kind soul, I envy not thy glory, nor think I'm pleased our partner in our sorrow. <clears throat> madam. I come. Shall I attend your majesty? Attend me, whither, to be crowned. <laughs> Let me with deadly venom be anointed, and die ere man can say, long live the queen. Take comfort, madam. The last word is to be found. Death and destruction follow us close, and will surely overtake us. In Brittany, my son-in-law, the Earl of Richmond, still resides who with a jealous eye observed the lawless actions of aspiring Gloucester. To him I would advise you, madam, fly, forthwith for aid, protection, and redress. He will, I am sure, with open arms receive you. Delay not, madam, for tis the only hope that heaven has left us. Do with me what you please, for any change must surely better our condition. My father would advise you, madam, this instant to remove the princess to some remote abode where you yourself are mistress. Dear madam, take me hence, for I shall never enjoy a moment's peace here. Nor I. Pray, mother, let me go too. Come then, my pretty ones, <gasps> let's away. <laughs> for here you lie within the falcon's reach, who watches but the unguarded hour to seize you. I beg your majesty will pardon me. But the young princess must on no account have egress from the tower, nor must without the king's especial license, of what degree soever any person have admittance to him. All must retire. I am their mother, sir. Who else commands them? If I pass freely, they shall follow me. For you, I'll take the peril of your fault upon myself. My inclination, madam, would oblige you. But I am bound by oath and must obey. Nor, madam, can I now, with safety answer for this continued visit, please you, my lord, to read these orders. Oh, heavenly power, shall I not stay with them? Such are the king's commands, madam. My lord? Tis too true, and it were vain to oppose him. Support me, heaven, for life can never bear the pangs of such a parting. Oh, my poor children! Oh, distracting thought! I dare not bid them as I should farewell, then depart in silent stabs my soul! Oh, what must you leave us?
us, my lord, what shall I say? But for a time, my loves, we shall meet again, at least in heaven. Won't you take me with you, mother? I shall be so afraid to stay when you are gone. I cannot speak to them, and yet we must be parted. Then let these kisses serve for well. Why, oh, why, just heaven, must these be our last? Give not your grief such way. We should be summoned when we part. I will, since it must be. To heaven I leave them. Hear me, ye guardian powers of innocence, awake or sleeping, oh, protect them still. Still may their helpless youth attract men's pity, that when the arm of cruelty is raised, their looks may drop the lifted dagger down from the stern murderer's relenting hand and throw on him in his knees and penitence. Oh, mother! <laughs> oh, my good children! Stand all apart. <clears throat> Cousin of Buckingham, my gracious lord, give me thy hand. Had linked by thy advice and thy assistance is Gloucester seated on the English throne. <laughs> but say, my cousin, what, shall we wear these glories for a day, or shall they last and we rejoice in them? I hope for ages, sir, long may they grace you. Oh, Buckingham, now do I play the touchstone to try if you be current friend indeed. Young Edward lives, so does his brother York. Now think what I would speak. Say on, my gracious lord. I tell thee, cuz, I've lately had two spiders crawling upon my startled hopes. Now though thy friendly hand has brushed them from me, yet still they crawl offensive to my eyes. I would have some kind friend to tread upon them. I would be king, my cousin. Why, so I think you are, my royal lord. Ha! <laughs> Am I king? Tis so. But Edward lives. Most true, my lord. Cousin, thou wilt not be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastards dead, and I would have it suddenly performed. Now, cousin, canst thou answer me? None dare dispute your highness' pleasure. Ah, indeed. He thinks thy kindness freezes, cousin. Thou dost refuse me then, they shall not die. My lord, since tis an action cannot be recalled, allow me but some pause to think. I'll instantly resolve your highness. I'll henceforth deal with shorter sighted fools. None are for me that look into my deeds with thinking eyes. <laughs> High reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. The best aunt is, it may be done without him, though not so well, perhaps. He had consented, why then the murder had been his, not mine. We'll make shift as tis. Come hither, Catesby. Where's that same Terrell whom thou toldst me of? Hast thou given him those sums of gold I ordered? I have, my liege. Mm. Where is he? He waits your highness' pleasure. Mm. Give him this ring, and say myself will bring him farther orders instantly. Deep revolving Buckingham no more shall be the neighbor to my counsels. As he long held out with me untired, and now he stops for breath, Will it be so? How now, Lord Stanley? What's the news? I hear, my liege, the Lord Marquis of Dorset has fled to Richmond now in Brittany. Why, let him go, my lord. He may be spared. Archie Ratcliffe, when thou sawst Anne, my queen, is she still weak? Has my physician seen her? He has, my lord, and fears her mightily. Oh, but he's exceedingly skillful. She'll mend shortly. 
I hope she will, my lord. Mm. And if she does, I have mistook my man. Ah. I must be married to my brother's daughter, at whom I know the Breton Richmond aims, and by that knot looks proudly on the crown. And then to stain me with her brother's blood, is that the way to woo the sister's love? No matter what's the way, tear falling pity dwells not in my eye. For while they live, my goodly kingdom's on a weak foundation. Tis done. My daring heart's resolved, they're dead. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late request that you did sound in me. Well, then let it rest. Dorset has fled to Richmond. I have heard the news, my lord. Stanley, he's your near kinsman. Well, look to him. My lord, I claim the gift, my due by promise, for which your honour and your face engage the earldom of Hereford, and those movables which you have promised me I shall possess. Stanley! Look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. What say your highness to my just request? I do remember me, Harry the Sixth, did prophesy that Richmond should be king. <laughs> when Richmond was a peevish little boy. Tis odd, a king, perhaps. My lord, I have obeyed your highness' orders. May it please you to resolve me in my suit. Lee Tyrrell hither, I'll see him instantly. I beg your highness here, my lord. I'm busy. That troubles me! I'm not in the pain! Oh, patient heaven! It's thus he pays my service? Was it for this I raise him to the throne? Ah, oh, if the peaceful dead have any sense of the vile injuries they bore while living, then sure the joyful souls of blood-sucked Edward, Henry Clarence, Hastings, and all that through his foul corrupted dealings have miscarried with will from the walls of heaven in smiles look down to see this tyrant tumble from his throne, his fall unmourned and bloody as their own. Would it were done. There is a busy something here that foolish custom has made terrible to the intent of evil deeds and nature too. As if she knew me womanish and weak, tugs at my heartstrings with complaining cries to talk me from my purpose. And then the thought of what men's tongues will say, of what their hearts must think. To have no creature love me living nor my memory when dead. Shall future ages, when these children's tales is told, drop tears in pity of their hapless fate, and read with detestation the misdeeds of Gloucester, the crooked back tyrant, cruel, barbarous, and bloody? Will it, they say, not so? That to possess the crown, nor laws divine, nor human, stop my way? Let them say it. They can't but say I had the crown. I was not fool as well as villain. Hark, the murder's doing. Princes, farewell! <laughs> to me, there's music in your passing bell. Now, my dear, how are the brats disposed? Say, am I happy? Hast thou dealt upon them? To have done the thing you gave in charge, beget your happiness, then, sir, be happy, for it is done. But didst thou see him dead? I did, my lord. And buried, my good Tyrrell? I have thought to ask to your highness' pleasure. <laughs> I have it. I'll have him, sure. Get me a coffin full of holes, let them both be crammed into it, and hark thee in the night time, throw them down the Thames. Once in, they'll find the way to the bottom. <laughs> Meantime, but think how I may do thee good and be inheritor of your desire. Uh, I humbly thank your highness. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> About it straight, good to conclude it done, my lord. 
Why then my loudest fears are hushed. The sons of Edward have eternal rest. And Anne, my wife, has bid the world good night. <laughs> Why, fair Elizabeth, my beauteous niece, like a morn, lights upon my onward wishes. My lord, good news or bad that thou comest in so bluntly? Bad news, my lord. Morden is fled to Richmond, and Buckingham, backed with the hardy Welshman, is in the field, and still his power increases. Morton with Richmond touches me more near than Buckingham with his rash levied numbers. But come, dangers retreat when boldly they're confronted. A dull delay leads impotence in fear. The fiery expedition raise my arm, and fatal may it fall on crushed rebellion. Let's muster men. My counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. My tender babes, my unblown flowers picked by untimely hands. If yet your gentle souls fly in the air and be not fixed in due perpetual, hover about me with your airy wings and hear your mother's lamentation. Why slept their guardian angels when this deed was done? So many miseries have drained my eyes that my woe-weary tongue still is mute. Why should calamity be filled with worry? Let's give them scope, for though they can't remove, yet do they ease affliction. Why then, let us be loud exclamations to Richard Haste and pierce him with our cries. Hark! This way he must pass. Alas, I'm not the daring to confront him. I have a mother's right. I'll force him to hear me. Who interrupts my expedition? Dost thou not know me? Oh. Art thou not my son? I cry your mercy, madam. Is it you? Art thou my son? Aye, I thank heaven, my father and yourself. When I command thee to hear me, madam, hear me. I have a touch of your condition that cannot brook the accent of reproof. Stay. I'll be mild and gentle in my words. And brief, good mother, for I am in haste. Why, I have stayed for thee, just heaven knows, in torment and in agony. Came I not at last to comfort you? No, on my soul. Too well thou knowst it. A grievous burthen was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. Thy prime of manhood, daring, bold, and stubborn. Thy age confirm it, most subtle, proud, and bloody. If I am so disgracious in thine eye, let me march on and not offend thee, madam. Strike up the drum. Yet stay, I charge thee to hear me. If not, hear me, for I have wrongs will speak without a tongue. Methinks the very sight of me should turn thee into stone. Where are my children, Gloucester? And where is thy brother Clarence? Where Hastings? Rivers? Vaughn? Gray? The floors of trumpets strike alarms, drums! Let not the heavens hear these telltale women! Rail on the Lord's anointed! Strike, I say! Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with a clamorous report of war, thus I will drown your exclamations. Then hear me, heaven, and heaven at his latest hour be deaf to him as he is now to me. Ere from this war he turn a conqueror, ye powers cut off his dangerous thread of life, lest his black sins rise higher in account than hell has pains to punish. Mischance and sorrow weep thee to the field, heart's discontent, languid and lean despair, with all the hells of guilt pursue thy steps forever. Though far more cause, yet much less power to curse abides in me, I say amen to her. Stay, madam, I would beg some word with you. What canst thou ask that I have now to grant? 
Is it another son, Gloucester? You have a I have none. You have a beauteous daughter called Elizabeth. Must she die too? For whose fair sake I will bring more good to you than ever you or yours from me had arm. So in the lead of thy angry soul, thou drown the sad remembrance of those wrongs which thou supposed me the cruel cause of. Be brief. Lest that the process of thy kindness last longer in telling than thy kindness date. Know then that from my soul I love the fair Elizabeth and will, with your permission, seat her on the crown of England. <laughs> Alas, vain man, how canst thou woo her? That I would learn of you, as you being best acquainted with her humor. If thou wilt learn of me, then woo her thus, sent to her by the man who killed her brothers, a pair of bleeding hearts, thereupon engraved Edward and York. Then, happy she will weep, on this present her with a handkerchief stained with their blood to wipe her woeful eyes. If this inducement move her not to love, read o'er the history of thy noble deeds. Tell her thy policy took off her uncles, Clarence, Rivers, great, nay, and for her sake made quick conveyance with dear Aunt Anne. You mock me, madam. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the way to win your daughter. <laughs> what shall I say? Still to affront his love, I fear but will incense him to revenge and to consent I should abhor myself. Yet I may see you in complying thus. By sending to Richmond word of his intent, shall gain some time to let my child escape him. It shall be so. I have considered, sir, of your important wishes, and could I but believe you real? Ah, now by the sacred host of saints above. Oh, do not swear, my lord. I ask no oath, unless my daughter doubt you more than I. Oh. <laughs> My kind mother, I must call you so. <laughs> be thou to her my love soft orator. Plead what I will be, not what I have been. Not my deserts, but what I will deserve. And when this warlike arm shall have chastised the audacious rebel, hot-brained Buckingham, bound with triumphant garlands, will I come and lead your daughter to a conqueror's bed. My lord, farewell. In some few days, expect to hear how fair a progress I have made. Till then, be happy as you are penitent. My love goes with you to my love. Farewell. Relenting, shallow-thoughted woman. How now, the news? Most gracious sovereign on the western coast rides a most powerful navy, and our fears inform us Richmond is their admiral. There do they hull, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. We must prevent him, then. Come hither, catch me! My lord, your pleasure. Post to the Duke of Norfolk instantly, but him, bid him straight levy at the, uh, all the strength and power that he can make, and send him suddenly at Salisbury. Commend me to his grace. Away. Well, my lord, what's the news you have you gathered? Richmond is on the seas, my lord. Ah, there let him sink and be the seas on him, white-livered runagate. What does he there? I know not, mighty sovereign, but by guess. Well, as you guess. Stirred up by Dorset, Buckingham, and Morton, he makes for England here to claim the crown. Ah! <laughs> Traitor! The crown? What is thy power, then, to bend him back? Is the chair empty and the sword unswayed? Is the king dead? Why then, by the tenants, where be thy tenants and thy followers, the foe upon our coast, and there are no friends to meet him? Or hast thou marched them to the western shore to give the rebels conduct for their ships? My lord, my men's are already in the north. The north? Why, what do they in the north when they should serve our sovereign in the west? They yet have no orders, sir, to move. If tis your royal pleasure, they should march. The, I'll lead them on with utmost haste to join you. Where and what time your majesty shall please? What? Thou be gone to join with Richmond? What? Uh. No, sir, you have no cause to doubt my loyalty. I ne'er yet was, nor e'er will be false. Away then to thy friends and lead them on to meet me. Hold! Come back, I'll not trust thee. 
I thought of a way to make thee sure. Your son, George Stanley, sir, I'll have him left behind. And look, your heart be firm, or else his head's assurance is but frail. As I prove true, my lord, so deal with him. Away. My lord, the army of great Buckingham, by sudden floods and fall of waters, is half lost and scattered, and he himself wandered away alone, no man knows whither. Has any careful officer proclaimed a war to him that brings the traitor in? Such proclamation has been made, my lord. <laughs> my liege, the Duke of Buckingham is taken. Off with his head. So much for Buckingham. <laughs> my lord, I am sorry I must tell more news. Out of it. The Earl of Richmond, with a mighty power, is landed, sir, at Milford. And to confirm the news, Lord Marquis Dorset and Sir Thomas Lovell are up in Yorkshire. Huh. Why, aye, this looks like rebellion. Ho, oh, my horse! By heaven, the news alarms my stirring soul. Come forth, my honest sword, which here I vow, by my soul's hope shall ne'er again be sheathed, nor shall these watching eyes have need for rest till death has closed them in a glorious grave, or fortune given me measure of revenge. <laughs> Thus far into the bowels of the land have we marched on without impediment. Gloucester, the devouring boar whose ravenous appetite has spoiled your fields, uh, its ripening hopes of fair posterity is now eaten in the center of the isle. And here receive we from our father Stanley lines of fair comfort and encouragement such as will help and animate our cause. On which let's cheerly all courageous friends to reach the harvest of a lasting peace or fame more lasting from a well-fought war. Your words have fire, my lord, and warm our men, who looked me thought but cold before disheartened with the unequal numbers <laughs> of the foe. Why, devil him still our cause would conquer him. Thrice is he armed that has his quarrel just, and he but naked, though locked up in steel, whose conscience with injustice is corrupted. The very weight of Gloucester's guilt shall crush him. His best friends, no doubt, will soon be ours. He has no friends, but what are such through fear? And we no foes, but what are such to heaven? Then doubt not heaven's for us, let's on, my friends. True hope ne'er tires, but mounts with eagles' wings. Kings, it makes gods, and lesser creatures kings. <laughs> Pitch our tent in Barsworth Field. My good old Norfolk, the cheerful speed of your supply has merited my thanks. I am rewarded, sir, and having power to serve your majesty. You have our thanks, my lord. Up with my tent. Here I will lie tonight. But where tomorrow? <laughs> well, no matter where. Has any careful friend discovered yet the number of the rebels? My lord, as I from spies am well informed, six or oh, seven thousand is their utmost power. Why, our battalion rebel that, uh, treble that amount. Besides, the king name is a tower of strength which they upon the adverse faction want. Their wants are great yet, my lord. These e'en of motion, life, and spirit, did you but know how wretchedly their men disgrace the field? Oh, such a tattered host of mounted scarecrows. So poor, so famished their executors, the greedy crows fly over their heads, impatient for the lean inheritance. Oh, uh, now, by St. Paul, we'll send them dinners in apparel. <laughs> Nay, give their fasting horses provender, and after fight them. <laughs> How long must we stay, my lords, before these desperate will give us time to lay them with their faces upwards? Unless their famine saves our swords that labor, tomorrow's sun will light them to the ruin. So soon, I hear, they mean to give us battle. The sooner still, the better. Come, my lords, now let's survey the vantage of the ground. 
Call me some men of sound direction. Um, my gracious lord. What sayest thou, Norfolk? Might I advise your majesty, you yet shall save the blood that may be shed tomorrow. How so, my lord? The poor condition of the rebels tells me that on a pardon offered to their lives, of those that instantly shall quit their arms, young Richmond, ere tomorrow's dawn, were friendless. Why, that indeed was our sixth Harry's way that made his reign one scene of rude commotion. I'll be in the men despite a monarch or no. Let kings that fear forgive blows and revenge for me. <laughs> when the weary sun has made a golden set, and by yon ruddy brightness of the clouds gives tokens of a goodly day tomorrow. Sir William Brandon, you shall bear my standard, my Lord of Oxford, and Sir Walter Herbert, and you, Sir William Brandon, stay with me. The Earl of Pembroke keeps his regiment. Here have I drawn a model of our battle, which parts in just proportion our small power. Here may each leader know his several charge. Sir, a gentleman that calls himself Stanley desires admittance to ah. the Earl of Richmond. Now, by our hopes, my noble father-in-law, admit him, uh, my good friends, your leave a while. My honored father, on my soul. <laughs> the joy of seeing you this night is more than my most knowing hopes presaged. What news? I, by commission, bless thee from my mother, who prays continually for Richmond's good. The queen, too, has with tears of joy consented, thou shouldst espouse Elizabeth, her daughter, <laughs> at whom the tyrant Richard closely <laughs> aims. In brief, for now, the shortest moment of my stay is bought with hazard of my life. Prepare thy battle early in the morning, for so the season of affairs requires, and this be sure of. I, upon the first occasion offered, will deceive some eyes and aid thee in this doubtful shock of arms, in which I had more forward been ere this, but that the life of thy young brother George, whom as my pawn of faith stern Richard keeps, would then be forfeited to his wild revenge. Farewell. The rude enforcement of the times denies me to renew these vows of love which so long sundered friends should dwell upon. Yet we may meet again, my lord. Till then, once more farewell. Be resolute. Conquer. Give him safe conduct to his regiment. Well, sirs, tomorrow proves a busy day. But come, the night's far spent. Let's into council. Uh, Captain, an hour before the sun comes up, let me be waked. I will in person walk from tent to tent and early cheer the soldiers. O thou, whose captain I account myself, look on my horses with a gracious eye. Put in their hands thy bruising irons of wrath that they may crush down with a heavy fall the usurping helmets of our adversaries. Make us thy ministers of chastisement, that we may praise thee in our victory. To thee I do commend my watchful soul. Ere I let fall the windows of my eyes, sleeping and waking, oh, defend me still. Catch me here, my lord. Send out Percival at arms to Stanley's regiment. Bid him for sunrise meet me with his power, or his son's George's head shall pay the forfeit for his cold delay. But is my beaver easier than it was, and all my armor laid into my tent? It is, my liege, all in readiness. What is it o'clock? It is nine o'clock, my lord. Good Norfolk, hie thee to thy charge, whose careful watch choose trusty sentinels. Doubt not, my lord. Be stirring with the lark, good Norfolk. I shall, my lord. Saddle White Surrey for the field tomorrow. Is ink and paper ready? It is, my lord. An hour after midnight, come to my tent and help to arm me. 
Good night, my friends. He thinks the king has not that pleased alacrity nor cheer of mind that he was wont to have. A mere effect of business. You'll find him, sir, another man in the field. When you shall see him with his beaver up, ready to mount his neighing steed with whom he's smiling, seems to have some wanton talk, clapping his pampered hides to hold him still. Then with a motion swift and light as air, like fiery Mars, he vaults him to the saddle, looks terror to the foe and courage to his soldiers. Tis the dead of night, and half the world in a lonely, solemn darkness hung. Yet I, so coy a day, asleep to me, with all the weary courtship of my care, tired thoughts can win, can't win her to my bed. We and the stars do weep as twere with o'er watching a forth and walk a while. The air is refreshing, and the ripe harvest of the new mown hay gives it a sweet and wholesome odor. <laughs> How awful is this gloom! And hark! From camp to camp, the hum of either army still sounds. That the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whisper whispers of each other's watch. Steeds, threatened steeds, and high and boastful neighs piercing the night's dull ear. Hark, from the tent the armorers accomplishing the knights with clink of hammers closing rivets up give dreadful note of preparation, while some, like sacrifices by their fires, watch with patience sit and inly ruminate the morning's danger. By your heaven, my stern impatience chides this tardy gated knight like a foul and ugly witch does lip so tediously away. To my couch once more and try to sleep her into moving. Oh. Mm. That means that dismal voice. It is the echo of some yawning grave that teems with an untimely ghost. It's gone. It was what my fancy, or perhaps the wind, <coughs> forcing its entrance through some hollow cavern. <laughs> no matter what, <clears throat> I feel my eyes grow heavy. Oh, oh. oh thou whose unrelenting thoughts not all the hideous terrors of thy guilt can shake, whose conscience with thy body ever sleeps. Sleep on while I, by hen's high ordinance, in dreams of horror, wake thy frightful soul. Now give thy thoughts to me, let them behold these gaping wounds, which thy death-dealing hand within the tower gave my anointed body. Now shall thy own devouring conscience gnaw thy heart and terribly revenge my murder. Think on the wrongs of wretched Anne, thy wife. E'en in the battle's heat, remember me, and edgeless fall thy sword. Despair and die. Richard, dream on and see the wandering spirits of thy young nephews <laughs> murdered in the tower. Could not our youth, our innocence, Persuade thy cruel heart to spare our harmless lives. Who but for thee, alas, might have enjoyed our many promised years of happiness. No soul save thine but pities our misusage. Oh, it was a cruel deed, therefore alone. Unpitying, unpitied, shall thou fall. The morning's dawn has summoned me away. And let that wild despair, which ever now does prey upon thy mangled thoughts, alarm the world. Awake, Richard, awake, to guilty minds a terrible example. Ah, 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 give another horse! Bite up my wounds! Ah, 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 ah. Oh, mercy heaven! 
Soft, oh, it was but a dream. But then so terrible it shakes my soul. Cold drops of sweat hang on my trembling flesh. My blood grows chilly in the freeze with horror. Oh, tyrant conscience, how dost thou afflict me? Will I look back? Tis terrible retreating. I cannot bear the thought, nor dare repent. I am but man, and fate, do thou dispose me? My lord, Who's the there? early village cock has thrice done salutation uh, to the morn. Your friends are up and buckle on their armor. Oh, Catesby, I have had such horrid dreams. Shadows, my lord, below the soldiers heeding. Now by this day's hope's shadow tonight have struck more terror to the soul of Richard than can the substance of 10,000 soldiers, armed all in proof and led by shallow Richmond. Be more yourself, my lord. Consider, sir, were it but known a dream had frightened you, how would your animated foes presume on it? Uh, perish the thought. <laughs> no, ne'er it be said that fate itself could awe the soul of Richard. Hence babbling dreams you threaten here in vain. <laughs> Conscience of aunt, Richard's himself again. Hark, the shrill trumpet sounds the horse away. My soul's in arms and eager for the fray. Near four, my lord. Ah, Tis well, I'm glad to find we are such early stirrers. Methinks the foes less forward than we thought of worn as we are. We brave the field before them. Come, there looks life in such a cheerful haste. If dreams should animate a soul resolved, I'm more pleased with those I've had tonight. Methought that all the ghosts of them whose bodies Richard murdered came mourning in my tent and roused me to revenge them. A good omen, sir. Hark, the trumpet of the enemy, it speaks them on the march. Why then, let's all my friends to face them. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as, as modest stillness and humility. But when this blast of war blows in our ears, let us be tigers in our fierce deportment. For me, the ransom of my bold attempt shall be this body on the earth's cold face. But if we thrive, the glory of the action, the meanest here shall share his part of. Advance your standards, draw your willing swords, sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully. The word St. George, Richmond, and victory! Saw the sun today. He has not yet broke forth, my lord. And he disdains to shine, for by the clock he should have braved the east an hour ago. Not shine today? <laughs> Why, what is that to me? More than to Richmond, for the selfsame heaven that frowns on me looks lowering upon him. Prepare, my lord. The foe is in the field. Come, bustle, bustle. Compar comparison, my horse. Call forth Lord Stanley, bring him, bid him, bid him bring his power. Myself will lead the soldiers to the plain. Well, Norfolk, what thinkst thou now? That we shall conquer. But on my tent this morning early was this paper found. Jockey of Norfolk, be not so bold, for Dickon thy master is bought and sold. A weak invention of the enemy. Come, gentlemen. Now each man to his charge, and ere we do bestride our foaming steeds, remember whom you are to cope with all. A scum of Bretons, rascals, runaways, whom their o'ercloyed country vomits forth to desperate adventures and destruction. What says Lord Stanley? Will he bring his power? He does refuse, my lord. He will not stir. Off with his son George's head. Yes. My lord, the foes are already post the march. After the battle, yet let young Stanley die. Oh, why, after it be then, a thousand hearts are swelling in my bosom. 
Draw, archers! Draw your arrows to the head! Spur your brown horses hard and ride in blood! And thou, our warlike champion, thrice renowned St. George, inspire me with the rage of lions! Upon him! Charge! Follow me! Yeah! What ho, young Richmond? Oh, tis Richard called. I hate thee, Harry, for thy blood of Lancaster. Now, if thou dost not hide from my sword, now are the angry trumpet sounds, alarms, and dying groans transpierce the wounded air. Richmond, I say, come forth and singly face me. Richard is hoarse with daring to thee, uh, uh, with thee to arms. Rescue! Rescue! My lord of Norfolk, haste! The king enacts more wonders than a man, daring and opposite to every danger. His horse is slain, and all on foot he fights, seeking for Richmond in the throat of death. Nay, haste, my lord, the day's against us. A horse! A horse, my kingdom for a horse! This way, it's this way, my lord! Below yon thicket stands a swift horse! Away! Ruin pursues us! Withdraw, my lord, for only flight can save you! A slave! I have set my life upon the cast, and will that stand the hazard of the die! I think there be six Richmonds in the field, five I had slain instead of him! A horse! A horse, my kingdom for a horse! If Richard's fit to live, let Richmond fall. Thy gallant bearing Harry, I could plod, but that spotted rebel stains the soldier. Nor should thy prowess, Richard, want my praise, but let the cruel deeds have stamped thee tyrant. So thrive my sword, his hands high vengeance draws it. My soul and body on the action both. The dreadful lay here's to decide it. <laughs> 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 Catch thy arm, the chance is thine. But oh, thy vast renown thou hast acquired in conquering Richard does afflict him more than even his body's parting with his sword. Now let the world no longer be a stage. No, be contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody actions, the rude scene may end. <sighs> and darkness be the barrier of the dead. Long live Henry. 
Henry the Seventh, King of England. about the production, about uh, John Wilkes Booth and, and his Richard, if you have questions about it, uh, the cast and I and, and the director, Beth Burns, uh, we're happy to, to take the questions. Yes? Would it be possible to read just one or two of the instructions about gestures or some part of the performance, just a couple of sentences to give us an idea of what his notes were like? Yeah, does anybody have any... Ideas. Um, we, we don't have a ton of his own personal gesture in the play. We just have accounts of what he did. Um, uh, he was known for the first of like uh, incredible ringing hands, uh, which I try to do with a script in my hand, but you know. It's, 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 and uh, uh, that he was known for these wild, you know, very uh, visceral gestures. You know, he, he made Richard uh, like an animal. Recreating historic performance is a real challenge. There's, there's very little material to go from. A prompt book gives you sort of where the actors come in and off stage. It'll give you information about uh, sort of the editing of the script and what lines uh, John Wilkes Booth brings back from, from Shakespeare's folio version that Holly Sibber cuts uh, or, or changes around. Uh, so a lot of the sort of gesture, the, the movement, uh, a lot of the stories come from critical reviews, and there's hundreds of them. So you know, it's a matter of pouring through them and looking for that information about the, the ringing of the hands. So there's a moment that we know in John Wilkes Booth's fight scene at the end where uh, he apparently trips over a root <coughs> and continues to fight uh, from, from the ground. So that kind of information is fantastic for this, for this sort of work, but it takes a lot of time to sort of piece through everything to get there. Yeah. Um, maybe you could talk a little, since talking about Booth's performance specifically, how he differed from those that came before him in that introduction of realism? Yeah, so he's doing a really, uh, he's doing a remarkable job uh, at this moment. Um, John Wilkes Booth, his father, Junius Brutus Booth, was a very well-known Shakespearean actor uh, and was particularly known for doing a pretty raw Richard. John Wilkes Booth takes it and makes it even more raw and a lot more realistic uh, at a time where we think of sort of American realism American acting as being sort of like method acting uh, in, the, in the 20th century. You see elements of this in the 19th century with a lot of American actors. And so uh, you get, for example, uh, the, the fight scene at the end uh, is traditionally in Britain staged as a fencing, uh, a fencing fight. Uh, in, in the United States, this has been a sort of a really, they call it savage realism, uh, particularly of John Wilkes Booth's. It was so incredibly realistic. His father, Junius Brutus Booth, there's a story of him uh, at one point uh, in the, getting so carried away with the, the sword fight that he goes off the stage. He, he chases his Richmond uh, down the steps, into the audience, through the theater, out the door, around the block, the stage door, continues the fight onto the stage, back onto the stage, to the applause, thunder the applause. So uh, it was pretty, pretty significant. It was pretty different. Uh, there's accounts of actors many years after the fact reflecting on their experience performing with John Wilkes Booth, who would say that uh, when he showed up for rehearsals, many of them having performed Richard for years with other actors, they were shocked by the originality of a lot of his business, the stage business that they'd never thought of or seen before. Yeah. When did Hibbert do this adaptation? Yeah, so Kali Sibber does this in the early 1700s. Yeah, and so then it goes through a whole lot of different variations over time. 
so what we're getting here is actually it's uh, it is uh, Charles Keene's version of Kali, from the 1840s of Kali Sivers' uh, seven, 1700s <laughs> adaptation <coughs> of Shakespeare's Richard III. Who continues his own adaptations, mm -hmm. I would gather. Absolutely, and so John Wilkes Booth brings in his own sort of adaptations to it, some of them based on his father, some of them unique of his own, uh, and many of them different from Edmund Booth's. A lot of Edmund Booth, his brother, uh, a lot of his prompt books survive. I looked at four of them uh, last year, and each one of them uh, was dramatically different from, from John Wilkes Booth's version. Is there any way to, uh, to see Booth's political motivations come out of how he did what he did? Yeah, so the question was, do you, do you see sort of the political motivations uh, in John Wilkes Booth's performance? Yeah, you do, actually. I think so. Uh, there's something about Richard that I think he really there's something that speaks to him in this character. He thought it was, it was certainly one of his most well-known roles. Uh, it's one that he loved to play. Uh, it's also one that, uh, as the, the years went by in 1863, 1864, he started using lines from, from Richard III as sort of uh, Confederate uh, yeah. rally rallies. Rally. Yes, thank you. So there is there's connections to that. Kali Sibber's version of, of Richard III is also um, a tragic hero. It's been described as a tragic hero by a lot of scholars. Uh, and in that way, uh, you see him as a, as a sort of a, a flawed hero. You understand why he behaves the way that he does. Even though you realize that it's wrong and you realize he's sort of a villain, you understand why he acts the way that he has. Uh, and perhaps Booth saw something in that. Yeah. Um, so we know that um, John enjoyed a certain amount of celebrity in the South, um, but also that he lived in his brother's shadow in the North and on a national scale. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the differences between their Richards in terms of the script and also maybe their acting styles, what we know about that. Yeah, they, they sort of went at it in different ways. They actually performed Richard III for, for several years together. They performed uh, John Wilkes Booth, who was younger than Edwin Booth, played Richmond to his bro elder brother Edwin Booth's uh, Richard. Uh, and so they, he sort of apprenticed in that way and saw sort of what his brother was doing. They had very similar vocal tones. Uh, critics suggested that they were very similar in some ways, uh, in their mannerisms and in their voice. Um, but they were, they were radically different, it seems like. Uh, people were certainly comparing them. Uh, Edmund Booth was considered in many ways a stronger actor, but John Wilkes Booth was a much more handsome actor. <laughs> and that, that brought that soul to this. It still does. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I bet yeah. that made Christmas at their house really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. For the actors, well, what are some of the the techniques or the challenges of, of approaching uh, historical moments like this. How do you how do you do this? Like you said, the lack of material. The fact that we don't have all that much to go on other than prompt books. Um, we we have to kind of expound on what we know about the era. Which for us, we, we we I don't know that we've ever done anything in this era before, so we're learning as we go. So Hidden Room tends to do about a hundred years earlier or so, uh, sort of the Restoration period, and sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred. But I think one of the kind of beautiful and surprising things, there were a couple of times when we were working through it, and actors naturally sort of place themselves on stage, and Eric has di diagrams of the blocking, and it's, he would sort of say, like, you guys did that naturally. So I think there, there must be something common about how you tell a story, that even though the technique changes over the years, the story is the story, and good actors hopefully will find it regardless. Stuff gets passed down. It's fascinating. So you see, uh, for generations, there's a way of doing Richard III. And if you're going to be like John Wilkes Booth and come in and do something different, then you have to really commit to it. And you have to, you have to prove that it's better, because audiences know. Audiences will have seen all these other Richards. I think this is the most modern performance that the room's done. <laughs> 200 years old. Yeah, the closest to our time. Yeah. <laughs> but there was something interesting that also came out about Gesture, that coming out of 
especially for those of you who had just done uh, Nahum Tate's King Lear, which is the Happy yeah. King Lear, yeah. Uh, which is yeah, remarkable. Uh, in the Restoration it? period, yeah. there's a lot of work that um, yes, absolutely, a lot of work that's done in in trying to figure out what Restoration gesture was all about, and it has very specific sort of gesture. In the 19th century, what many of you seem to find was that that gesture continues on, but it morphs, right? Yeah, it, sort of it kind of like takes over your whole body, whereas you know, like with Nathan Lear, a lot of that was focused on up here. Your reading is was up yeah, here, box. drawing your attention, you know, to your face or what was happening there. But there's a great um, recording of like 1911 there, Richard. That um, I'm not sure who started it, but it was really fascinating to watch. It was done in the silent movie style and how incredible, I mean, it was the whole body, very presentational, very um, gesture heavy, but done with the whole body. And um, what he was telling us was it, it made sense on in the time how those theater, what those theaters were like. It was very rowdy, very loud. People were drinking, people were doing all sorts of unmentionable things up in the, up in the, the booth. So um, that was really interesting. And it's, it's hard, you know, in this kind of nice intimate space to, to think about that, but uh, I think Right, so those big really cool. whole body gestures then were really critical to yes. clue the audience in because they couldn't hear it. And so, that, you know, to sort of follow along. Yeah. Captures, captures your attention. And you're, you're trying to, as an actor, it's fascinating uh, training because you know immediately whether or not you have your audience. Yeah. You're all very polite, and yes. you're all. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if, if, it, if you know, in the 19th century, if an audience didn't like something, they would boo you off the stage. They'd throw things, uh, or they just, you know, you know, have a conversation with the person sitting next to them, or get up and you know go buy something and come back later. Well, that still happens. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not with you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, a couple more questions. We'll, we'll come back here back and we'll come we'll come over. Is the musical ensemble is that representative of that type of would there be a bigger orchestra or smaller during the um that could vary. Most theaters did have a house band of one sort or another and um, the Richard Third is interesting in that there is standardized music from the period, actually from quite a bit earlier. Um, the marches for Richmond and Richard um, are, I found in a source from 1815, but have found in much later sources as well, arranged for piano, they were used as uh, quick step dances, um, and, uh, and quite popular, and everybody knew them. So uh, the, there are transitions where I start with Richmond's march and then it goes to Richard's march. To us, we, it's hard for us to tell the difference. They're both pettings and beautiful D major uh, quick steps. Um, but the audiences would know them as Richmond's and Richard's. Um, I looked into size of uh, actual forces for some theaters. Uh, there's a theater in Montgomery, Alabama, where um, uh, Booth played Richard. Um, and it was generally about six players, um, a piano, a couple of violins, a clarinet, and a, a, a cello, I forget what else. But um, they were generally small groups. It, and that's a provincial theater. Um, places in uh, New York where Edwin Booth had, um, had his own music director, a fellow by the name of uh, Edward Monhau. Supposedly composed some original music for um, Edward Booth's Richard, which I haven't seen yet. <laughs> um, but uh, he had a full orchestra. Um, it varied, but the big cities had bigger, bigger bands. So Booth, uh, Booth was a member of the Star System. He would tour uh, to all these different theaters that would have stock companies of actors. And so he would show up with his Richard. And then uh, they would spend a couple days rehearsing it together, and then they would perform it but he would be the one who would be performing it. So these, there's no information about the music. There's moments where the music's described, but not specific songs in the prompt book. So what we know is that John Wilkes Booth would go to the theater and uh, whatever sort of Richard III music that they would normally play would be what was used. This does specify a Lord Mayor's March, Richmond's March, and Richard's March, mm -hmm. and a Dead March. I borrowed the Dead March from Handel's Saul 
I would like to find out if that was the case. I wanted to dovetail off of that because you mentioned uh, that he would go to this theater and they'd already been doing Richard. Their Richard would get bumped down. Yeah. And the way that he accomplished this was by sending these prompt books ahead. So that was the purpose of the prompt books. That's what we think, yeah. Yeah. So there's two, oh. two copies of the Richard prompt book, one of them here at the Ransom Center, one at uh, the Harvard Theater Collection. The idea is that he would have one at the theater he was performing at, and then he would send the next one along so that they could start getting ready. Um, and that would have all the blocking in it. And my favorite note in it was the one where the music needed to slow down or be longer so to cover his quick change. Yeah, there's so And it was many like, wait for Richard's change. Wait for the change. Wait for the, wait for the change. For the change. <laughs> yes. This is in John Wilkes Booth's handwriting. So he's actually making these notes himself. There's clearly many times where he's performing this Richard where they're, they're starting the scene without him. And he's still like, trying to change into his costume. Yeah. Yeah. And he's very yeah. insistent that they, they wait for him. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Part of my question was answered, but I'm curious about the, the hidden theater company. So you are a company? Talk to Beth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she, she is our matriarch. Beth Burgess, who's the artistic director yeah, of the theater. Love to know. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, we're a company, uh, Hidden Room Theater. Uh, I'm the artistic director, and I'm incredibly lucky to have uh, actors that work so quickly and so well together that they were able to prepare that in three rehearsals. Shut the door. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from the period in rehearsal. So obviously they wouldn't look like this if they were in a full production, which we hope to do um, in 2017 properly. And Howard Burkett, our Master of uh, Musical Research, manages to get all that work done to, to honor it. But yeah, so we're a company here in Austin. And what do you do for your ankles, sir? <laughs> How do you repair and care for your ankle? I was in pain the whole time. Oh. He's it's young. It's it's young. It's young. It just bounces back. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. So the question was whether or not Richard was, uh, how, how central was it to his repertoire? So we know, for example, uh, as part of the star system, John Wilkes Booth would move from theater to theater, oftentimes for, for two to three week engagements. And in that time, he would play upwards of six, six or so shows. That's a lot in a short period of time. He would sort of rotate them and repeat a couple times. Uh, this was his, one of his most uh, popular plays. Uh, this was his, uh, tragedy, where he could play an ugly villain, and it was played ugly, much to some chagrin from reviewers, <laughs> uh, who thought that it shouldn't be this ugly. And that especially for such a handsome actor as John Wilkes Booth, that uh, it seems a crime that he's playing it so ugly. Uh, but uh, he then would transition and do something completely different, like The Marble Heart, which was also played, was really well known for, where he could play a romantic male lead. So uh, he could, he, he showed his range through selection of the plays that he would perform. And, and for his father and his brother? For his father and his brother too, Richard. Richard is one of those roles for, for male Shakespearean actors, like Lady Macbeth for, for women. Uh, you, you just sort of really need to play it to, sh to show your, your range. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. of Shakespeare programming that will run through the end of spring. Again, there's calendars out in the lobby and information on our website. Also, there's a pair of keys that was left in the, in the lobby. So if you're missing your keys. <laughs>